Hey everyone, and thanks for jumping back into the macroverse. Today, we're gonna to talk about the most recent FOMC, and we're going to be discussing inflation. We will also talk about Bitcoin and the implications for it as well. If you guys like the content, make sure you subscribe to the channel, give the video a thumbs up, and also check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. There's certainly a lot to talk about today, so we will just go ahead and jump right in. The Fed held rates constant at 5.5%, which makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, we know the ECB cut, we know the Bank of Canada cut, but the U.S. economy is stronger relatively to its counterparts across the world. Therefore, they have the luxury of holding rates higher for longer than those other, other central banks. And this is something we talked about a lot. And the reason we spoke about it quite frequently was because, because the Fed has that luxury and other central banks will be forced to cut sooner it should be bullish for things like the dollar, right? And if you look at the dollar today, you know, it's still continuing to slowly go up, right? I mean, I know there's been a lot of doom posting about the dollar, but it is still putting in higher lows and it is still holding support above the bull market support band. So that continues to be something that plays out. And I still think it's it, it could certainly head much higher into the summer. It's one of those things that, you know, Strong opinion loosely held. I mean, I I think it's going to go higher into the summer, but if you get a weekly close below the bull market support band and then you get another one, then I'd be happy to just change my mind on that. But in the meantime, I do think it it does remain bullish for the dollar. And if you look at it in in you know the the U.S. dollar versus the the um, the Japanese yen, you can see it's just continuing to push back to those prior prior highs from from back in April. So. Certainly, certainly some, you know, some movements over in the Forex market. But what I really want to talk about are sort of what, what the Fed said, what Powell said, but also I, I want to discuss quite a lot about interest rates and, and where we might see them go. Now, if you rewind the clock back in early 2024 and in March 2023, market was constantly expecting rate cuts, Right. And back then, you know, I said when a lot of people were very, very, you know, certain that the Fed would never go to higher rates, I said, look, we're likely going to go to five and a half percent and we're going to stay there for quite a while. And it should cause blue chips of each industry to outperform the the sort of the alts of that industry. And you should see things like Bitcoin dominance go up and you should see that reflected across other different asset classes as well. Right. The blue chips of equity markets should take over and, and do really well. And, you, and that was where you saw, you saw the Magnificent Seven be born. So I, I think what's really interesting is going into the March meeting, the SCP, the Summary of Economic Projections, was forecasting that the Fed funds rate by the end of the year would be 4.6%, indicating three rate cuts. Now, at the June meeting, the Fed is only forecasting a Fed funds rate of 5.1% by the end of the year, signifying that they've reduced their expectations of three rate cuts down to one. And that's a big change. It's a big change. Furthermore, what is a somewhat puzzling to me is that they're expecting the unemployment, their, their unemployment rate projection for March for this year was 4%, but they still think it's going to be 4%. Now, the reason why that is slightly puzzling, and again, I mean, it's not, it is a stochastic process to watch the unemployment rate go up, but the reason why it's puzzling is because normally when you see the unemployment rate get above its bull market support ban, right, when you see that happen, or if you just pick out any any random moving average, right? If you just go and look at, say, like a 20-month moving out, or let's, yeah, let's go to the monthly time frame and, and grab a 20-month moving average. Normally, when it gets above it, it then keeps on going up, right? But the Fed is saying, no, their projections are, are basically just saying it's going to stay flat for the rest of the year, right? So it, it would look something like that is what is essentially what they are saying. Just stay flat for the rest of the year. Now, there is a chance that it could do that. And, and one way that it could do that is if it were to fall back down to, say, 3.8 and then slowly move back up to 3.9 and then maybe get back up to 4% by the end of the year. That's a possibility that, 
you know, you, you just simply cannot discount. Be that as it may, that is not what the historical record would generally suggest is the most likely outcome, although there are times where something like it, you know, could be argued to have occurred. If you go back to 2008, you know, once you got above the 20-month moving average and we started to move up right here, we then just blasted off much higher, okay? If you back look at uh, 2000, right, when we got above it, we slowly went up and then we accelerated after that. If you look at, at the 1990s, you can see a period where you form a low, you get above that 20-month moving average, but then you, you come back down for a while. So if we follow that path, and we fall back down to that 20-month moving average, which is currently at 3.67%, then you could see a way that it's possible, right, if it, if it were to fall back down. But there are definitely more examples where once it gets above that 20-month moving average, it just keeps on going up, right? Um, and so, and also, too, I mean, we, we crossed the 20, if you look in the 1990s when we first crossed the 20-month moving average, and we take a, a date range on this, by the time we got durably above it, it only took about seven or eight months, right? So the first time we got above the 20 month moving average over here was actually back in August of 2023. And, and now it's already been nine months out. So I don't even know that that's the best comparison. So it's a little strange to me. Again, it's, it's not impossible by any stretch of the imagination. We, we've seen this take a long time, but it does seem a little strange that they are projecting an unemployment rate of 4% by the end of the year when it's already at 4% now. And we know that it doesn't generally trend to go, it doesn't generally trend sideways. It either goes up or it goes down. Okay. So that's puzzling a little bit. And so maybe they're putting that in there so that if there is a move higher to say 4.1, 4.2, perhaps they would try to find some justification to start cutting. Because Powell has often said that, you know, until they actually get unexpected data, unexpected weakening in the labor market, then they really don't have a bias to cut. So if you go look again at the summary of economic projections, you will see that they've reduced it down to only one rate cut. And then if you go over to the dot plot, you will see that four of the members actually think that the, the Fed should keep rates at 5.5% for the rest of the year, right? And then if you look at, at the rest, seven members say to keep rates at five and a half, or to, 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 to lower them down by 25 basis points at some point during the year to five and a quarter. And then the rest, the other eight members, think that there should be two rate cuts. So there's four with zero, seven with one, and eight with two. So the median participant is saying one rate cut this year. What's, what's more interesting is when you look at 2025, because in 2025, there's one member of the of FOMC of the FOMC that is saying for out throughout 2025 the Fed funds rate should stay at five and a half percent. And then you have another committee member all the way down here that thinks the Fed funds rate should be closer to to three percent. So you can see just how different these forecasts are. It looks like most of the members are thinking, you know, right around four percent or so, uh, give or take, you know, maybe 25 basis points. Um, but it's certainly interesting to look at. And, and so when you think about the median forecast, the median forecast is calling for one rate cut this year. Market says, all right, maybe, but we're still going to price in two rate cuts. And you can see if you look at the cumulative probabilities by, the, by December of 2024, there's, the market is saying there's a 90.51% chance that the Fed funds rate will be 5%. And essentially a 0% chance that it'll still be at 5.5. A 9.49% chance that it'll be at 5.25. So the market is still saying two rate cuts are happening, whether the Fed says or not. So what is interesting, I, I, I sort of did some digging through sort of taking a, a walk down memory lane. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to suggest uh, that it has to play out the same way. I, I really am not. I just want people to be on the lookout for something because the Fed can often say things, but it doesn't mean they're going to follow through with them. Now, so far for this rate hiking cycle, they have done a great job of following through with what they say. I mean, they said higher for longer and they did. 
And, you know, we said they were going to go to five and a half percent and a lot of people didn't believe it. They kept calling for for alt season on lower rates and surprise, the blue chips, Bitcoin dominance keeps going up. So if you look at this, though, the Fed indicates it will cut rates, but not until 2020. You see that headline? That headline came out in June of 2019. So in June of 2019, the Fed said they're not going to cut rates until 2020. And then they cut one month later. One month later, they cut. What's fascinating about that timing is that in June of 2019, all Bitcoin pairs were sitting at support. They were sitting at support. If you go look at total three minus USDT divided by Bitcoin in June of 2019, all Bitcoin pairs were sitting at support. You see that right here, June of 2019. And the Fed meeting was right here. It occurred like right there. And then the following week, the very next week after the Fed meeting, all Bitcoin pairs broke down. After the Fed came out and said, no rate cuts until next year. The altcoin market finally threw in the towel against Bitcoin. Bitcoin still did go up a little bit back then. Um, but the altcoin market bled back to the king. And it finally broke support. A support level that it had been holding for almost a year. Almost a year. Right around a year. A little, a little less than a year. It finally broke support. Now what I find fascinating is that we find ourselves in a very similar position once again, where you have, in June of 2024, you have the Fed coming out and saying, you know what? Forget the three rate cuts we told you in the March meeting. It's only gonna be one rate cut now. So, June 2019, June 2024. Very similar in terms of getting extremely hawkish talk from the Federal Reserve, a very hawkish SCP compared to where we were in March. And if you go back and look at where all Bitcoin pairs were in March, you can see that, you know, really at the beginning of the month, at the beginning of the month, all Bitcoin pairs were all the way down here. And then they rallied on back up, right? All Bitcoin pairs rallied back up sort of on the, uh, the promise of, of all these rate cuts. And now we find ourselves back at the range lows as those rate, rate cuts are, are starting to get priced out. But I've also said the pricing out of rate cuts theoretically eventually causes them to get priced back in. I think it's interesting because fast forward the clock, and this is why I often compare us to 2019 because of where monetary policy is. Fast forward the clock and you know the, the support level is a little bit lower this time. But sure enough, you get another hawkish Fed, and they're saying they're only going to cut what the, once this year. Both in June, both times all Bitcoin pairs were sitting at support. Both times that support level had been holding for approximately one year. If you go look at all Bitcoin pairs, we've essentially been at these levels since June of 2023. So it's been a year. Over here, it was a little less than a year. Now it's been a year. So again, I'm not suggesting that the Fed has to cut in July. I'm really not. Uh, again, I, I'm not going to strongly go against what, what the market is saying. But I will say this. If, if altcoins start to capitulate against Bitcoin and they break below the range lows, I wouldn't be that surprised if the Fed cuts sooner than maybe the market ultimately expects. Um, not to say that they care about your alts, they don't, but it could be, you know, it could be something as simple as as it just reflecting a consumer that is is starting to need a little bit of help. Again, that doesn't mean they're going to go cut to three percent or something immediately, but they might throw in, you know, a couple of rate cuts this year, even though they've only said they're they're only going to do one. So, I would keep an eye on that. I would say, look, I mean, at this point, alt Bitcoin pairs still have not yet broken down, and there's always a chance that they just bounce up again and and then roll over a couple months later. But I, I would be, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least point these similarities out, right? Because you have a very similar setup in terms of in terms of US interest rates, right? If you overlay this on the chart, you will see in fact that when 
you know, the, when the Fed paused right here, all Bitcoin pairs had a rally, right? And if you look, if you look this cycle, and you look at when all, when they pause, you can see right here that all Bitcoin pairs had a rally. But then eventually, when the Fed, but right before the Fed cut, all Bitcoin pairs fell below support. And so I do, I do wonder if something like that's going to happen again, where they just keep on bleeding back to the kink. So that's why I think it's interesting to, to look at, at interest rates and then look at what the Fed's saying. And, you know, it is a hawkish dot plot compared to what they put out at the last meeting. But, you know, things can change. And, and I mean, I think, I think Powell has actually done a pretty good job of saying that they would pivot their views if, if the data warrants it. And so then what is the data saying right now? So for that, I think we need to go over to the inflation chart. And it did come in lower than expectations. So, you know, it came in, it looks like around 3.25% or so. I think they rounded it to maybe 3.3. But 3.25% for headline inflation. I mean, it, it, it's a it's good because it's going in the right direction, but it, it also just kind of has been at the same spot for about a year. What's really interesting is that inflation has been has been holding 3% as a low for almost a full year now, right? You can see this low here was in June. We just got the May data point. Look at all Bitcoin pairs, right? This low over here was in June, and now we're getting close to potentially breaking down. Isn't it interesting how ever since inflation has held at 3%, so too have all Bitcoin pairs? Maybe it's not a coincidence, you know? And if you look at it, it might be worthwhile to see what's sort of going on underneath, underneath like under the hood. And so for that, what we're going to look at is the inflation year over year per category. We're going to zoom it out. And then we're going to go through each category. We're going to start with, here's headline inflation, right? So you can see what it looks like. But we're going to look at food and beverages. So food and beverages continues to come down. It was 2.21% last month. This month is 2.12%. If you look at housing, it went up slightly from 4.52 to 4.56%. Apparel dropped from 1.35% to 0.806%. Transportation dropped slightly from 3.47 to 2.74. Medical care went up. Uh, from 2.63 to 3.07, so that's obviously not a good one to see. Though recreation did drop down from 1.51 to 1.36. Education and communication went up slightly. And then other goods and services is finally starting to fall after being at, at more elevated levels. It's now down to 3.78%. But remember, these categories are not weighted equally. And so if you look at them per category, or if you if you, if you you Look at them per category, but you, you you look at their approximation of their actual contribution. Um, that's, I think, more it gets more interesting. So here's headline inflation. Here's food and beverage, right? Food and beverage is not having a, a huge impact on it. It only makes up 0.3 of the 3.25. Housing obviously makes up a huge component, making up 2.03 of the 3.25. So again, it's based on one of the you know asset classes that lags the most. Apparel essentially contributes nothing to it. Transportation is, is not contributing a whole lot, but still about 0 0.4, 0 0.58. I guess that is kind of significant, 0 0.458. Uh, medical care is, is not really contributing much. Recreation is not really contributing much. And then education and communication is not really contributing much. And, uh, and not, neither is other goods and services. In fact, if you add on here housing and... Um, uh, what was the other one? It was transportation. If you add on housing and transportation, that essentially makes up 2.5 of the 3.25, right? I mean, that makes up most of it, just those two categories alone. So it, it's certainly good to see some categories showing disinflation, but then there's other categories like medical care and housing that actually ticked back up. So it, it's a slow process for sure. If you look at, at core inflation, it does continue to come down. Um, not maybe not as fast as the Fed would like, but look, it is still coming down, right? I mean, it's hesitated a little bit, but you know, now it's down to 3.41%. So it's moving in the right direction. And I, I think it will likely continue to move in the direct in the, in the right direction. It seems like if you look at a monthly change, you know, this most recent print was actually more negative than the month that came before it. And, and, and the month that came before that was positive. So it at least is trending in the right direction, which is something I think a lot of us would like to see. 
And then if you look at, at PCE inflation, this obviously wasn't updated. Um, it hasn't been updated in a little, little while, but it continues to slowly come down. And of course, if you look at like PPI uh, of all commodities and you look at, at say like a monthly change, it is, you know, it is slightly elevated right now. But, you know, that's where inflation is coming in. And, you know, the, the last print for inflation was, was, was in, uh, in the right direction for sure. But it still isn't, it doesn't necessarily make up for all the bad prints that we got for the first part of the year. But I will say that I would not be that surprised, right? I would not be that surprised if you see all Bitcoin pairs break down within the next few weeks. Because last cycle, we actually saw them break down in June, just before the Fed cut. Now, the, the thing is, is we don't know when the Fed's going to cut. If they don't cut until September, then it's possible that altcoins hold against Bitcoin until August, right? And maybe they just bounce back up and then come back down. Um, but I mean, when they bounce, right? I mean, like when they were at the lows last time in April, April 8th, I mean, you can see that on that bounce, it took two months to get back down to the lows, right? If it bounces again and it takes another two months, that gets you to August, right? So, you, I mean, you can see how it's not, it's not set in stone. It's not like it's a sure thing that they break down in June, but it is interesting that, you know, all Bitcoin pairs are essentially at the same place in June of 2024 as they were at in June of 2019. It, it seems interesting to me that you know that assets like ETH Bitcoin are you know they're at their third sort of potentially lower high here same time frame January February and May January February and May and then that May top occurred you know again just two months before the Fed started to cut they cut in July and I, I just wonder if it's playing out in a very similar fashion. But the, the point is, though, you know, whether the Fed cuts in July or September or even later, the point is, is that rate cuts keep getting pushed further and further out according to market expectations. And because of that, it should continue to be a, a tailwind for things like the Bitcoin dominance. I know it's somewhat of a meme at this point, but, you know, you can make it whatever you want. You can't deny that Bitcoin dominance has been in an uptrend for quite a long period of time. And, and a lot of people have been fading it every step of the way. A lot of these projects keep on bleeding back to the king, right? Especially some of the larger market cap altcoins. But even then, if you look at some smaller market cap altcoins and you look at things like others, Bitcoin, so everything outside of the top 10 against Bitcoin, it's been trending down ever since the year began. I mean, you can see that, right? It's been trending down ever since the year began. And furthermore, if you were to go look at, at something like the uh, the ADI, the Advanced Decline Index, for the top 100 cryptos, what you'll notice is that it's really starting to capitulate again here. You see that? So while the market has been doing okay in, by some measures, like Bitcoin's still at 66K, there's a lot of altcoins that are actually going down, right? There's more going down than going up, and that's why the Advanced Decline Index is dropping off again. And it also dropped off right over here in 2019, just before the Fed cut, right? It, it dropped off very, very quickly. Um, and then, of course, the Fed started to cut in, in July. So I would keep an eye on that because, you know, I, I think a lot of people, they keep calling for alt season and whatnot and for altcoins to durably outperform Bitcoin. But last cycle, we didn't reach that phase until after the Fed cut rates, right? And I mean, you can see over here after the Fed cut and we started to get that sweet, sweet QE this metric started to put in higher lows and higher highs. But at this point, the low that was set in January was just taken out. So I don't even know if this thing is definitively even bottomed yet in terms of the advanced decline index. Um, so that's something to keep an eye on, especially as it relates to sort of the breadth of the overall move. So again, my expectation is that Bitcoin dominance is going to go up to around 60%. I think altcoins will continue bleeding back to the king. If you look at alt Bitcoin pairs, we know that last cycle they capitulated one month before the Fed cut rates. We also know that in June of 2019, the Fed was very hawkish. They said they wouldn't cut until 2020. In June of 2024, the Fed was very hawkish. They said you're only going to get one rate cut. Forget the three that we told you. They said that at around the same time that alt Bitcoin pairs were sitting at approximately 0.4 a major support level, and then they eventually broke down 
to around 0.25. So there are a lot of similarities, right? E-Bitcoin is putting in the same types of three lower highs, I think, that I put in in 2019. Of course, it could deviate for sure. But it just seems very familiar, right? It seems very familiar. And so I do wonder if you're going to see a very big surge in the Bitcoin dominance over the next few months as, as Bitcoin continues to just sort of absorb that liquidity from, from the altcoin market. And if you think about it, the whole thesis for why Bitcoin dominance was going to go higher was because of, of rate cuts getting pushed further and further out and QE not returning because the Fed has to stay higher for longer. I think the people that underestimated the Fed, the Fed's resolve to stay higher for longer, they're also the ones that, have, that faded Bitcoin dominance like two years ago, right? And have been fading it ever since. Those are the people that, that, you know, they didn't believe the Fed because why should they? The Fed said inflation was transitory. The Fed was wrong. And while they were wrong by a lot of measures, they have stayed the course and they have continued to keep rate, rates higher for longer. And so you've basically said, been, in an, been in an environment where Bitcoin continues to take that liquidity. Bitcoin USD has gone up for the most part over the last several years. I mean, of course, um, there have been some down times, especially 2022, but Bitcoin dominance has generally trended higher, right? And that's because the Fed is, is staying a lot higher than a lot longer than a lot of people thought. And yes, there's some altcoins that do well at various parts of that move. But for it, you know, when you look back on this in, in 10 years, you're, you're just going to see this Bitcoin dominance uptrend where it just took back a lot of market share, right? You're not going to go cherry pick the 10 altcoins or whatever. I'm, it's, I'm sure it's more than 10, but you, you might not go cherry pick the few altcoins that outperformed. You'll just say, look, Bitcoin took over a ton of the market share you know, in 2023 and, and at least a good part of 2024. I think that's how history will ultimately remember this move. And, you know, it, it, it really goes to show that monetary policy does play a crucial role because in 2020, when, you know, which I think is a lot of, a, a big reason why people thought that, that Bitcoin dominance would go down was because in 2020, Bitcoin dominance was going down, right? But in 2020, the Fed was already cutting rates, right? And, and, that, and that's, of course, when Bitcoin dominance was going down. Fed hasn't started to cut rates yet, and so it's hard to make that case. That's why I keep thinking Bitcoin dominance will continue to climb that wall of worry, and, and the people calling for alt season will just continuously be disappointed until, until you finally get them to believe that you know uh, it's not happening. And then once they believe it's not happening, then maybe it actually happens. Um, but yeah, it, it's really interesting to look at, at the Fed funds rate, how it relates to in inflation. And of course, how all that relates to the labor market and risk assets like Bitcoin. But we'll go ahead and wrap it up there. Thank you guys for tuning in. Make sure you subscribe, give the video a thumbs up. And again, check out Into the Cryptoverse Premium at intothecryptoverse.com. We'll see you guys next time. Bye.